thought this uh, was quite an interesting topic, this idea of um, communities and open practice. Some of my own work with uh, the JISC in Higher Education Academy, um, UK OER programme, examined this idea of open communities and uh, practice. And some of what we found was that the idea of communities and open release sometimes don't sit with one another. Because when people think about producing resources within a community, there are boundaries around that community and it can sometimes lead to producing resources with, a, with a, an audience in mind, shall we say. So what I want to do is to draw on some other work that I've been doing with my colleagues Isabel Faulkner and Lou McGill. And this was a vision paper that we wrote for the European community. The IPTS Research Centre in Seville put out a call for vision papers. Um, think about learning in 2030. And so what we tried to do was to think about this idea of open communities and um, open practice. So I'll take you on my little journey. What we did was we thought about the idea of learning can be either sol solitary on your own. I mean, all of us learn sometimes on our own, but also learning is very social. And it can be structured. We can go to a course, or we can structure learning ourselves, or it could be non-structured. So um, we wrote a little scenario around this idea of a creative writing group. So within the writing group, you have a group of people who are coming together and they're just interested in writing and they find that working together and learning together helps them. So we have different members of the group who sometimes study on their own. So we might have Emily who's doing self-study and that helps her uh, in terms of her input into the group and her working and learning with the group. And uh, we might have Dominic, who's on a technical publishing open course. And this is a course he's doing online, but he's doing it in a solitary way. He doesn't necessarily meet with other learners. And then um, we may have somebody who's in a, a different kind of group, um, for example, releasing open educational resources. So the ideas from that can feed into the, the creative writing group. And uh, he's also on a facilitated course so with a group of people. So he discusses ideas, and that helps him with his creative writing. And then we have Carla, and she's doing a course in social work. So she's negotiating and learning with other people. And that feeds into her work in the creative writing group. So one of the key literacies that people need in order to form part of a, an open community like this is the ability to fluidly move between these different learning contexts. And each context that we learn in helps us build our learning in other contexts. So when we wrote this vision paper, we tried to identify, you know, what what needs to happen for this kind of scenario to be possible? And so we, we know that the learner needs to have control over his or her learning. So people need to have the, the key confidence, motivation, and the literacy to be able to do that. Secondly, we need to recognize that our learning contexts are constantly in flux and, uh, and seek opportunities to, to bring together. So, what are we learning in one context that can help us build on what we're learning in another context? We also recognize that universities are changing. They're opening up. We're seeing evidence of that. But that really has to continue. Not only do universities have to open up, but other organizations. So in, uh, in, in various programs around the world, we've seen third sector organizations releasing resources or companies or lots of different organizations, but this really has to go forward. There has to be more of a radical opening up of organizations. And then we have to rethink the metrics that we use around learning. How do we know that people are learning? At the moment in education, we use accreditation, um, but the whole idea of accreditation and 
dropout rates, for example, might not fit with this idea of open learning. It depends on people's purpose. Why are they learning what they're learning? So in our call to action, we try to identify some of the issues that we might have to face. And here they are, that uh, people, learners, might not be able to structure their own learning for various reasons. It could be confidence, it could be um, uh, digital literacies, it could be that they've never been in that kind of uh, environment before, where they're expected to structure their own learning and, and uh, take forward their own learning pathways. Um, there's an obvious tension between the idea of open and standardisation, and yet the two somehow have to fit together. The current metrics, accreditation and so on, we need to have a, a rethink around that. Some very interesting work going on in open badges, but we really need to extend beyond that to think about how do we know people are learning. Um, and this idea of open access and closed organisations, again, doesn't fit. So, um, for some people, learning analytics is the holy grail, but we're not really there with learning analytics. It's really in its, its infancy. We have um, other people who say that learning analytics in its current state doesn't al allow for the kinds of expertise that people need to know who to learn with or where to find the learning. So these are some of the issues that uh, we need to think about. So I'll leave that scenario and that idea with you. I haven't answered the question, but, uh, but there are a lot of questions in there about how we might go forward. So what I'm going to do is now ask Mike if he will come and if he'll put forward his ideas. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, I'm interested in the transition. Um, it's probably more of an expansion because uh, it doesn't reject what's gone before, but it extends it in connection with open and open education. So on the left-hand side is perhaps what's current on the right-hand side is what's becoming. So open educational resources are moving towards being not just resources, but activities and communities. Open access. Access is not enough. You need people not only to access material, but to engage with it, to learn productively with it. Free courses, again, it's not enough just to take a free course. You need to be able to continue to learn. You need to have access to that course after it's finished. You need to have it as a resource, preferably for the rest of your life. MOOCs, um, as one of the speakers earlier on today said, the interesting issue is not just around massive open courses, but localization of them. Courses that are appropriate to your local needs. Moving from open learning, where it's the provision of content, to open social learning, where you're engaging with other learners in a productive learning community. And moving from citizen science, where you are a provider of data to scientists, to open communities of scientific practice. So I'm interested in that transition. That's interesting. What that should have been is the homepage for the Open Science Lab. So imagine the homepage for the university's Open Science Lab there. Um, and what it is, is uh, the Open University for the last um, 50, 40 years has been making available not only scientific materials but scientific practices. So engaging learners in active science. We used to send out home experiment kits like lasers and fish tanks through the post. Now most of that's online. And the Open Science Lab is the way of making that open to people. Um, which is great in theory. Um, in practice there are some superb materials that are available there, but it's not widely enough known. And when you go to it, many of the materials, it's difficult to access because of the web browser, because of incompatibility, because it takes a long time to load. So the lesson, I think, from our Open Science Lab is we have some superb materials, 
but we have to make them available and we have to enable people to engage with them. Let's see if this works. Okay, iSpot is one of the more successful aspects of the Open Science Lab and I think it encapsulates where I would like to see where we are moving, which is that it's an open community. Um, there are 40,000 people now who engage with iSpot. It's a community where you can observe and record and share observations of nature. So anything, trees, birds, plants, funguses, you can take a picture, you can give your own um, identification of that, and then other people in the community provide confirmed identifications, normally within a few hours, sometimes a few minutes. Um, it's also a, a productive community because people within there gain expertise. You gain expertise from commenting, from contributing, from supporting other people. And so it's an open community where your expertise is valued, where it's made visible, and you are supporting other people. The difficulty with it was that to kickstart a community like that, you need to have expertise at the start, which is why um, iSpot started just in the UK with people who had recognized expertise in communities like the Field Studies Council. We didn't open it up to other countries because nature is localized. So birds and funguses and so on are localized. So it's not easy to open it up to other countries. We're just starting to do that now, but to do that, you need to provide ways to engage experts as well as members of the community. You need to provide ways to author the tools and customize them for different localizations. So it's not simple to create open communities that are also localized. FutureLearn, um, which is at the moment quite dear to my heart, that's the front page of FutureLearn, um, and it says learning for life. That's an aspiration, not a reality yet. We don't know whether it's going to be learning for life because it's only been going for a year. We will know whether it's learning for life in maybe 20 years time. If the company sustains, if we have communities of learners who are not only taking courses, but learning together as uh, productive learning communities. And we're developing the notion of a future learner. Um, and the future learner is somebody who doesn't just take courses, but learns along with other people outside the courses, gathers together as a learning community, perhaps meets up face to face. So how can you develop a lifelong learning community um, and a community in which you have open sharing of materials? So materials shared amongst the partners, so the analytics materials, the data that you collect, but also open sharing of educational experiences with other people, and that's a challenge. So where I think we want to get towards is something like this, and it comes from John Seely Brown and Richard Adler, um, their article in EduCourse called Minds on Fire, and this is a kind of depiction of, uh, of one of the aspects of that. Firstly, you want to have access. There it is again. For some reason, doesn't like the Open Science Lab on Max. Um, so you want access to open educational communities, not just resources, massive open social learning, so engaging socially with other people in terms of um, successful learning, and a combination of both e-science and e-humanities. So you want to have a broad range of access. You want a set of tools um, to support your learning, both individually and uh, along with other people. And these are two tools that we've been developing. One of them is called Senseit on the left. It's on the uh, Google App Store now. It allows you to access all of the sensors on a mobile phone. And mobile phones now have about 25, 30 sensors, humidity sensors, temperature sensors. And the idea is to develop communities of people who carry out citizen inquiries, citizen investigations. So they propose an investigation that you might do with a set of tools on mobile phone. For example, um, one that we were working with, with uh, 15, 16 year old kids was what's the fastest lift in the country? You can find out that by putting your mobile phone on the lift floor and with the accelerometer in it, go up three floors. You can then find the acceleration and from that, you then do a little bit of maths to find out the velocity of the lift. 
and you can then see which lift in the country is the fastest one. So you set a challenge for other people to use their mobile phones to try and find the fastest lift in the country, or to create a noise map around your school or around your community. So the idea is you're creating toolkits for open learning, and the right-hand side is one of those toolkits, and we're about to uh, develop another one around um, inquiry missions. And the third piece of the jigsaw puzzle is sharing, so creating an open knowledge construction system where you are um, visibly sharing your knowledge and your expertise with other people and creating visible webs of learning uh, and what we're calling a citizen inquiry platform. So bringing, if you like, citizen science, inquiry learning and Kickstarter so that you um, have groups of people who initiate their own investigations and carry out those investigations with other people in an open and visible community. So these, I think, are the central issues. Firstly, how do you understand the practices? So we need to do some very deep research in OER into understanding the practices of open lifelong learning, inquiry, sharing, and community building. Secondly, developing truly open resources. Um, so one of the aspirations, again, in Future Learn is for open, discoverable, and shareable. So the resources are not just open, but you can discover them um, through search engines, and you can share them with other people, and that is sustainable over a long period. And lastly, how do you create viable and sustainable communities? Um, for example, how do you manage reputation in those communities so that people are valued and supported? These are some of the challenges I see of moving from open educational resources to open educational communities. Um, has anybody seen this picture before? Anybody? Show of hands if you've seen this picture. Have you seen this picture? Do you, do, do you know what this picture is? No? Okay, good. If you do know, then don't tell anyone because you'll spoil it. But what I'd like you to do is, um, I, maybe you could drop the, the lights down if that's possible, just so you can see it a bit clearer, if that's possible. <laughs> and the glitter balls as well when I finish, for Alan. Um, what I'd like you to do, please, is tweet what you think this picture is about. Um, use the hashtag down here, hashtag WPPH underscore RC. So what's going off in that picture? So my name's Jonathan Worth. So I'm, a, as I say, I've been an editorial photographer for the last um, 20 years. I'm gonna talk a little bit now about things that I think are pretty cool. Um, and I'm gonna sort of speak to this idea of building communities on open practice as a way forward for lifelong learning. So what it means to be an editorial photographer has changed fundamentally. It changed when things became digital and it changed with the rise of the internet. And so what that means is when I came to teach a class in 2008, um, that was the first time I'd, I'd acted as a teacher from being a photographer. I couldn't teach the same class that I'd, I'd learned. My, my course I did was written in the 70s. You know, the, 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 the business at that point, there were significant barriers to entry to becoming a photographer. They were technological, the cameras were really difficult to use, and they were, and they were financial. It was, really, it was really expensive to buy that kit to become a photographer. So my, my business model was based on a kind of scarcity of supply. But I couldn't teach that, not in a world where there was an abundance of images. And I didn't know what to teach, and I didn't know how to teach it. So I open sourced the problem in 2008, and I put my class on a blog, and I asked um, if anybody else knew what I should be teaching, and appropriate ways to be teaching that. And, um, and a lot of people turned up. There were nine people in the room at that point, in 2008. Um, and when I put it onto the blog, within one term, we had 900 people who were coming to answer and workshop the question. And then within, within 30 weeks, we had over 35,000 people who had come to the class to work out how, how we teach and what we teach to be a 21st century photographer. So this is what my class looks like. Um, this is uh, one of um, Martin Hawkes' um, Twitter visualizations, thanks to him. Um, but this is one of the environments where the conversation happens about the class. This is Twitter. The conversation lives on Flickr and Vimeo and YouTube and SoundCloud and lots of other spaces. This is one of the conversations. This is Twitter. Now that dark spot in the middle, does anybody know what it is? Anybody want to chuck a guess in? We can do it live, analog style. You can just put your hand up if you want to. Just say it. 
<laughs> um, one of the big problems with nine people in Coventry, and let's face it, no one from Coventry is here. Coventry, at that point, the, the course had no history. It wasn't an aspirational place to go and study photography. So one of the big problems for going to, uh, to study photography was how to get your images seen. They saw all these famous people that I had photographed and said, you know, I want to work in New York as well. And I want to photograph those people. How do I do that? And I genuinely didn't know. But the effect of opening this class out as a blog put them at a place that I'd never, ever been able to be myself. It was at the center of this network. That dark spot there is, is a room at the back of a, of a converted cinema on the ground floor in Coventry. That's the classroom. They're all the students, and that's the conversations that are happening around them. So all those people around them, they're not in a classroom. And um, they have something in common with these people here. They're not in a classroom either. So, so I, I, I've not seen what you've said, actually, what you thought this was, the title of this was, or what do you think this picture is about. So for me, well, I'm, I'm pretty clear what this picture is about. This picture is, the title is called Signal. It's by a photographer called John Stanmayer. And he, he won the World Press Photo Award this year with this image. So for those of you that aren't familiar with the World Press Photo Award, it's kind of the Pulitzer Prize for photographers. Um, and he won this, it's Signal. These African, African migrants, uh, wannabe migrants, they're standing on the shore of Djibouti, and they're trying to get a free telephone signal from Somalia. <coughs> I wonder how many of you said they were photographing the moon. Uh, but my, my point here is, and this is the thing that I think um, really sort of stirs me, is why did it take a photographer from New York to go make this image? If all these people have mobile phones and are able to make images, um, and they're tenuously connected to the internet, why are they not making this photograph? These are the people that most need to tell this story. So they are the people that I now have outside and around my class. They are the people in the cloud. The World Press Photography Award also runs an educational department, and they have done since 1990. It's a competition to get into this class. And the best, uh, best applicants, 10 a year, get to go and study with the best photographers in the world. And I asked them, I said, so what's the point in this then? And they said, well, it's to put something back. It's to raise the general quality of citizen journalism, you know, it's to put something back out there into the community. And I said, 10 people at a time? Really? <laughs> so we looked at how we could model their academy on the phone our class, how we could turn it open. And this year, for the first time, anyone can do the World Press Photo Academy right now. It's on Facebook. It's happening for the lucky winners, and there still are winners, across North Africa. It's happening on site in Istanbul at the minute. And there are lots of North, uh, I think there are 10 North African winners that are doing the course right now. But there are 11 million people in the World Press Photo Network that can now do this class. Um, that's, that's really where I wanted to leave it. But um, there is another really interesting, exciting project which I'm um, look out for this summer, which I think is going to be even bigger. I'm Victoria Eva from Pearson. Um, just to let you know who Pearson is, we're um, a global learning company. So we've uh, got about 48,000 people working around 80 countries, and we offer a range of educational materials, uh, electronic learning programs, assessments, uh, and, and various sort of scoring related services to teachers and students of all ages. And what I'd like to do in this presentation is just give you a few ideas of what uh, we think about. Um, what open means to us, uh, how we're implementing this in various practices around Pearson and what that's doing to the various communities we talk to and what the implications there are for, for lifelong learning through that. So just skipping ahead. Um, so what does open uh, mean to us? This is not a very um, exhaustive list and it's still something that we're deliberating and debating about. Um, we were asked to be a bit controversial, so I guess my one controversial point is that you won't see free on here. Um, we're a commercial organisation, um, and so open for us is more about uh, uh, resources and content and product and services that are, uh, are available. 
Uh, so open for us is more about availability and having sustainable uh, resources and, and means of, uh, of educating people. But what open does mean to us is, is a lot of things. A few of them are sort of illustrated on here. So we've got open content. Uh, we do offer our content openly. Um, uh, and there's a range of benefits to this in terms of uh, getting feedback on the content we supply uh, in order to improve it and improve the, the general educational um, outcomes out there by, by adding to the debate on this. Uh, we offer our content uh, through open licenses. We collaborate with various uh, organisations to do this through various <laughs> platforms. Uh, and we also offer our content through open APIs, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, so open also would mean freedom to experiment, uh, so we want people to have access to the content so they can create even new products and services out of it and, and repurpose our content in, diff in different ways. Uh, open to us would also mean open data, so we uh, look into using open and linked data to tag educational content to make it more uh, searchable. And we want to use smart data to better identify learning outcomes uh, and make this and, and just improve uh, the products and services we have. But again, that feeds into the wider educational debate. Um, we also look at open in terms of access and accessibility. So we want um, you know, every learner we con come into contact with to um, have access to our services. And this should be regardless of their age or resources, background. Uh, the country they come from, uh, or disability. Uh, we want to promote shared learning resources. We're offering various tools that can utilise OERs and open content. Uh, and open for us is about collaborations as well. We want to engage in open conversations about our work <coughs> and ways to improve our content and find new partnerships amongst uh, learners, students, teachers, uh, and commercial sort of strategic partnerships as well. So to give you a bit of a flavour of the kinds of uh, ways we implement Open at Pearson, I've just put a few examples up here. Um, we have uh, Plug and Play. Uh, this is an initiative that makes our content available to developers so they can create new products and services out of it uh, through Open APIs. Um, so this could generate a new developer community uh, to share ideas and experience. And obviously it benefits us in terms of helping innovation at Pearson, which can, innovation can be a problem when you're a, a, a pretty big company. So this helps on the innovative point. Uh, but also it benefits the wider learner community in putting new products and services out there. Uh, we also have the Pearson Catalyst for Education. Um, this helps us identify um, education startups. Uh, and the thinking behind this is that we recognise we can't build the best future. Uh, for education loans, so we like to work with various uh, startups and, and companies and organisations, and we offer our sort of resources in terms of expertise, uh, try and break down barriers for them to develop their own products and services, which can then go out into the wider learner community. Uh, we also have Open Class. This is a, a cloud-based uh, free platform. Um, and within that, it's, uh, it has a, a repository or, or marketplace called the Open Glass Exchange, uh, which has various uh, uh, resources on it, particularly OERs, which uh, education, educators can use to uh, uh, amalgamate and turn into their own courses uh, using the online exchange. Uh, we also have Pearson Collections, and that acts as a content source for the exchange. So educators can, can um, access various resources through this, be it premium or OERs, uh, and then create and custom their own learning materials through that. So we, and we utilise OERs in sort of various ways. We have repositories that provide OERs. Uh, we have something uh, from our repository Aquella called Content Without Borders, which is an open access repository. We're using Open through Open Badges, so we're offering academic institutions and associations uh, credentialising programmes. Um, so this gives people a digital badge um, and allows them to uh, put that badge on various platforms like LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter, and it just verifies the skills that that person has got um, through the Open Badge system. We're also looking into MOOC assessments, 
Uh, we think MOOCs sort of offer various benefits to teachers and education uh, institutions and learners. But we think assessment is a really important part of that to validate the MOOCs and skills that people are acquiring through those MOOCs. Uh, so we're offering a suite of assessment services through that. And um, you might have seen also that I put down efficacy, and this is a new drive we have at Pearson, um, which we launched last year. And this is about making sure that we have a measurable impact on improving someone's life through learning. Um, we want to be able to state the outcome we produce rather than simply the input that we provide. So we want to know how we're making an actual impact on learners and a tangible one at that. Um, and so we have various goals through the efficacy framework, but um, relating to this, we think that efficacy will imply a new way of working with our customers uh, and an ongoing interaction and co-creation with them. So we think that in order to find the best learning outcomes, we don't want to be able to, to do this alone. We think we're going to have to collaborate and exchange um, with, with you, our partners, uh, various leading education, education institutions, uh, to sort of co-create solutions on this. So we want to share our approach with everyone and invite feedback on it and work together. So efficacy is certainly a work in progress for us and it's about an open global conversation uh, about learning outcomes ways that we can improve learning outcomes, find the different <coughs> learning outcomes, uh, and we want to do this in line with the various uh, communities we already have. So, last slide. Um, implications that, that I see in terms for, of, for lifelong learning um, through the various practices we have at Pearson. Um, we think that um, open will lead to helping us find and identify those targeted learning outcomes by building this open and diverse community of stakeholders to have these conversations about learning outcomes and therefore improve um, uh, ideas and debate in that learner community. Uh, we think that open will help to personalise learning through data, um, OERs that can enrich content and services already out there so learning becomes more individualised and catered to each learning. Um, we think that Open will contribute to this idea of blended solutions around learning. You'll have your face-to-face -face and traditional ways of learning and your formal learning resources, but that will be supplemented by OERs, MOOCs, data-driven technologies, uh, and various new uh, open approaches coming out of uh, uh, these debates and, and developments. Open will contribute to new technologies, uh, bringing them to the fore. Um, and they'll, an open is part of this new technological debate that's happening all the time around us. Um, it will contribute to innovation in learning through developer communities, through open APIs. So new products and services are going to be developed all the time. And it will hopefully help to globalize learning so it can encourage a global approach, uh, supporting skills recognition across borders, enabling a more global workforce. Uh, and that skills recognition is important through using various assessments um, and, and badging schemes, for instance, those skills then become more transferable, portable, and global in nature, and build up communities between employers, learners, and institutions, so better learner pathways can be developed from learning to career and college and readiness. And hopefully it will foster more interactions, so encourage new partnerships and collaborations and ways for all different st stakeholders to reach out to each other. Um, and hopefully that will lead to improving the wider educa educational debate as a whole. Thank you very much. All I have is a timer. I think there was a, a, a troop of actors from this country and they said something like, and now for something completely different. <laughs> if you can't tell, I'm the American. And uh, I have no slides. I've never done this without slides. I'm going naked here. But this, uh, this is freeing. I'm not fumbling with things and trying to get the thing to appear. This is, this is kind of amazing. Sorry, that's a little diversion. When Allison sent out the topic, I looked at it and I said an expression like, what is that? Like, that sentence, like, who's going to argue with that? 
And my initial plan was to get up here and do a complete rant about how terrible openness is. We have no evidence, and I couldn't do it without laughing. I'm just not that good. So I decided to break down the sentence, which still kind of mystifies me, and maybe we'll get to that in our discussion. And I'm going to start at the end, and that's a storytelling technique that uh, we teach. You start with the end of your movie. So um, lifelong learning, what is that? Anybody? I mean, we say it a lot. It sounds great. Is anybody against lifelong learning in the room? Um, yeah, in the back there, OK. <laughs> I like that. There's always one in the room. I, I can appreciate that. But more than that, does anybody who's alive as a sentient being not engaged in some sort of learning? And then we're going to get in this terrible def definition thing. What is learning? What do we mean by learning? But a lot of time as educators, we tend to focus on this thing that we're used to doing in our institution. And now we're faced with this thing now that we call informal learning. There's all this kind of learning that goes on outside. And we're, we're trying to deal with the situation of how do we integrate this going on. But face it, anybody that you look at out on the street, they have to be learning something in order to be surviving. That's, that's just my opinion. And then um, open practices. Um, I'm certainly not going to define what open means. Um, if you can't tell, I don't like definitions. But to me, we, we can talk about the resources, and we can talk about uh, the open courses and the materials. And openness, to me, is a lot broader. Um, and it needs a system, a place that provides it. And there's this thing out there that's been around for 25 years. I think we take it for granted called the web. You've heard of it, right? Okay. Uh, this, this is a check to see if you're paying attention, sorry. <laughs> you can go back to your tweeting, Martin. <laughs> but it's an amazing thing. And I gave a talk um, about three weeks ago to an organization in the state of Colorado. They have an e-learning organization that was 25 years old. It was founded a month after Tim Berners-Lee you know, put together his proposal uh, for the web. So I, I played with that idea. And I went back and, and He's written some things about like his original vision for the web, and it's, it says everything about it that matters to me. And it begins with the importance of the link, the lowly link, that thing that you click on. And maybe don't think upon how magical it is, but every link is equal. Every link can leak to anything else. That is open. Although some people, my contrary, are trying to change the weighting of how that will play. I'm not responsible for that. But that is an important key thing to his idea. And he was framed with this idea of working in this complex organization, this physics research institution. And he wanted to deal with the fact that people didn't know what was going on in other parts of it because there's so much work going on. And it was a problem that he started with, with this particular problem to solve. But what he wanted to do, hello, um, was really solve a more complex problem of how we deal with a large amount of information that is dynamically changing. And he had this second part of the vision, he said, that the web would become this place that is a mirror of how we work and live. So it's not an exact copy of, of the lives we live. And that's kind of where we are right now. I mean, we've got social media. We I don't know about you, but I buy a lot of things on the web. I never thought I'd be doing that. And it's become not part of the, everybody in the world's life, but it's become significant. And it's become that mirror of the web. And then he had the third part of the vision, um, where he said that once we had a lot of information about what we're doing and what we're working on online, we'll be able to analyze it, a little bit of analytics, but be able more so to understand how we live and work, and how we can do that better. And that's a powerful vision. And to me, that is the core of what openness is. And the web provides this kind of potential energy for all these things that we want to happen. And involve, hey, Nigel, wait, wake up. What? <laughs> I've never met Nigel. We met because we, he broadcast on our internet radio station, DS106 Radio. There's the plug for it. Um, <laughs> for life. Um, he broadcasts from Waikato, New Zealand, and he, all he does is play music, and then he tweets out what he's playing. I never even talked to him in person until last night. We, we have talked on Google Hangout. But that happened because of this open space. So the open practice part, to me, is really what we do in that space. And that's what the web enables. And that's important to me. And wow, well, I have two minutes left. So getting on to uh, point two, building communities. That's another one of those phrases. We talk about it all the time, right? Do we actually build a community? Communities happen. 
The place I live, uh, well, I lived for a while at Phoenix, Arizona. Has anybody been to Phoenix? You, you know the housing style there? Okay, Phoenix did not exist as a city 120 years ago. Okay, there are phone booths here older than that, I think. <laughs> so, but they have these things in Phoenix, and they kind of baffle me. They are called master planned communities. And sometimes I think when I hear building communities, that's what people have in mind. So a master plan community, they take a, a wad of desert land, they bulldoze it, take away some beautiful vegetation, that's another story. They build these houses that look identical. They have these streets that are carefully organized and named after rivers and things like that, which aren't even in the desert. And they put up a wall around it. And then there's a gate that you have to actually have a card or pay a fee to get inside. And that is a master plan community. And I don't know about you, but when I think about what a community feels like, it's like that place in the park where people gather informally. And it wasn't designed, it just happens. And that's, to me, the community building that I have found important um, isn't, we want to try to make things work but can potentially happen, but we can't build it. And we can't say, it's going to happen here because we put up a wiki. Sorry, Wikimedia. I love wiki. <laughs> but, or here because we have a, a forum, et cetera. People need to be able to move around in these spaces and be able to flow in and out. And it's chaotic, and it's unorganized, and sometimes it doesn't work very well. And then evidence, because that's where this started with. And when I think of evidence, that means I have to prove something to you, okay? So you want proof, right? That was the question. You want proof that building communities of open practice are something for lifelong learning, which I totally buy into that. I have no argument with the question. But I don't have, to, I don't have evidence. I don't have to give you evidence because I have lived this experience for 20 years, and I have had a long list of, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the openness of the internet and the connections and things that have happened. So I think we need to give people the experiences so they can understand the openness, not say you need this tool or this resource or this particular community that we've built. We've got to create a lot of opportunities for people to experience this firsthand, and there goes my buzzer, eight minutes. Wow, what can I say after that? Um, we've got a lot of questions uh, through Twitter. Uh, so what I'm going to do is structure the next part of the session, a discussion um, around some of these questions. But I'm also going to invite some comment, because I think we've got some roving mics as well. So the questions are up here, as you can see. I'm going to start off with uh, some of the specific questions about future learning and some that are uh, directed maybe towards the commercial environments like future learning Pearson's as well. So uh, I'll ask Mike if he would answer two specific questions about future learning. One is um, from just legal. How do future learning encourage institutions to make their courses open? And then there's another one about uh, what is future learn? What problem is future learn the answer to? Over to you. Okay. Um, so future learn encourages um, all of the partner universities um, to make their material as open as possible. Um, so essentially, it's up to the partner universities. Um, if the partner universities are able to source open material uh, under a Creative Commons license, then that's great, and some of the partners are doing that. Some of the partners have material, for instance, from BBC or from other sources or from British Library that may not be um, open access. Um, but wherever possible, we encourage um, the partners to use um, open resources um, published under Creative Commons license. And um, I'm just looking at the FutureLearn terms and conditions here, which again are published openly on the FutureLearn website. Um, any learner content that's published on the public discussion areas of the website will be subject to a Creative Commons license um, by NCND. We will not make available any learner content related to your assignments or assessments. So all learner created content is published under a Creative Commons license. What that means, for example, is if we do research on any user-provided content, we have to acknowledge um, the, the learner um, because it's been published under Creative Commons license. Uh, so that's 
Um, and uh, in, from the research point of view, um, on the terms and conditions, there's a section under how data will be used. Uh, we've got an agreed ethics framework, which again is published openly, and it's been agreed amongst all the partners. Um, so all of the partners and FutureLearn are subject to uh, an ethics agreement. Um, that's as open, I think, as we can be um, as regards um, content of publishing. I'd be interested to hear any comments back from that if you think that FutureLearn, in terms of the agreements with the partners and, and in terms of open publishing of content, if you think there are issues or problems still to be resolved. Okay, maybe I can encourage people to, to tweet any further any follow-up <laughs> that they have. Um, so I'm going to ask a, a broader question, and this is uh, maybe to Victoria and to Mike as well. So how difficult is open in a commercial environment? Can open and close coexist? And that's a question from Simon Thompson. Thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely think open and close um, can coexist. Um, and I, I think they should. I mean, as I said, um, I wouldn't completely define open simply uh, as free. Um, and I was hoping that uh, through my presentation, I'm showing that, uh, that we have a range of sort of open initiatives, uh, uh, open I ideas, and trying to build open communities. Um, but within that, we're always going to have, there will be some closed proprietary systems uh, around that. And the, the trick is to try and get a balance, uh, try and make um, uh, what we're offering sustainable. So within that, there could be some closed or, or premium models uh, being offered. So I think in the future, there is going to be uh, this, this idea of sort of blended learning solutions coming out and this mix of open and closed. But I don't see why we can't have, have both uh, in order to offer sustainable um, solutions uh, uh, whoa <laughs> but uh, not to uh, I'm on this side of the table but um, for our uh, session tomorrow that we're doing we're talking about uh, openness with inside a corporate culture at 3m that my colleague and I have done and I I think we tend to think of this open closed versus open and what we realize is that there are possibilities of being having open principles inside of an organization um, and you have some porosity between them that allows things to flow. I mean, in, in a commercial organization, there are some things that just can't be open um, to do with uh, salaries, for example, of all the employees and commercial. Uh, some of the business models, if you want to run a viable organization, there are some things that you can't open up. But in terms of the learning, in terms of the content, in terms of the practices, in terms of the communities, then we should all be striving, and we are striving, towards um, openness. Um, not just um, open publishing, but towards, as I said in, earlier, um, open learning communities. And in terms of the resources, it means not just um, a, an open license, but it in, means discoverable, um, so that you can get access to those materials through web searches, and shareable, so that you can easily share them, and sustainable, so that those resources are available for a long time to come. Um, there will be legacy content, and there will always be content that for one reason or another um, has been published under uh, other licenses. And it, it would be silly to um, ignore or to restrict that, to say that you can't include that in courses, because there are some superb content that we want to have from some of our content partners, but that has been produced under other licenses. So we've got to have some mixed economy that allows us to have open materials as a bedrock, but also other published materials included in the courses. And that essentially is left up to the partner universities. OK, there's, there's a question here from Mick Shepherd. Uh, and uh, I'm going to primarily ask this to Jonathan and Alan in the first instance. So is implicit celebration of social learning always positive or more ambivalent? What are the potential drawbacks? Good question. Hmm. I, I actually, um, I, I did this talk at this conference in Colorado. I call it my amazing stories of openness because of these things that happen uh, of serendipity. and. Um, uh, a teacher came up afterwards and she's like, did you ever have a, a story of something where it went terribly bad? 
And I was, I was very curious. And, and I said, actually, you know, no one's really brought that story to me. And she, she had this experience where uh, she had her students engage in, uh, they, they created um, basically a, a game, you know, and that was part of their, their learning. And they entered it in a contest um, that was sponsored to reward these kind of efforts. And I guess they came in last. And some of the comments that came in on the site um, were actually insulting. And, and so there's this behavior that can happen. And, and it's this behavior that we have to accept in these open spaces. I mean, we want all these glorious things to happen. But you sort of have to allow that dark side to exist that we never want to look at. And that human behavior actually um, resulted in this negative experience for her because um, maybe it was the construct of the way comments were set up, um, or the way the questions were framed, and you know anybody who like really wants to be perverse and spend a lot of time reading YouTube commentary um, knows that this happens, and um, and so you kind of have to live with this fact that that people and human behavior can go this bad, and you know you do your best in order when you set up these things to not just blindly go into it. Um, but you know, it's it's a thing that we have to. We can't like have all the goodies of the internet without allowing for the possibility of that, that deep side. Yeah, I was just still trying to process this idea of um, having to charge for content. Actually, and, uh, and sort of um, <laughs> at the same time, I was trying to uh, listening to sort of having listened to you saying what's the worst that, what's the worst thing that happened, and it kind of puts me back in um, in sort of year two, I think, of me doing my, my class openly when the university found out what I was doing because. 10,000 people had come and and a particular I was somebody was charged with um, supporting me because the VC at the time was really very positive about this um, this what she described as innovation but the person who was charged with supporting me in commas, um, I don't think he necessarily was and what he said to me was um, he said uh, I've given lots of things away for free Jonathan but the thing is by giving things away for free people don't want to pay for them yeah. and that was the last time I saw him <laughs> and, um, but what I think the thinking was there that um, the product, that my product as a teacher was information. Now I'd gone through the same thing as a photographer. I used to think my product was photographs, right? And then I thought it was images when they, things became digital. But it wasn't. I tried to charge scarcity prices for images the way I had done for photographs, artifacts, and it just totally didn't work. I realized some time later that in fact images were one of my products. I had a whole raft of other ones. Now as a teacher, this idea that my product is information. It's the same sort of thinking that goes to a library and says that, um, it's the same sort of thinking that values the books in a library over the librarian, right? Mm. There's books are just information. You go to the library, you say, we've got to have, we've got to have all this information, we need a big wall around the library, but it's just a bunch of books. You can't go and ask for a book you've never heard of. You need a librarian to take you by the hand and give all this information meaning. Right? And so my product as a teacher is not the content. I can happily give it away for free. Mm. What you need is my time for me to lead you by the hand and give it meaning. Meaning and information aren't, don't come necessarily bundled together. And so I, I disagree with this idea that one has to charge for content. I don't think that's the future. And I think all the work that I've done has shown that in fact it isn't the future at all. You can charge for experiences that can't be reproduced on the internet. Okay, so uh, let's move on to another question, and, and this is more about um, other organizations other than educational organizations being involved in open learning. So a question from Joe Wilson, um, what's the role of learning societies and professional associations in facilitating and supporting communities of practice? And um, also a question from Krista Appleton about how realistic it is that formal education institutions will or can be open enough for open benefits and still survive. So who would like to, to take that something about the organizations opening up? <laughs> yep. So I think learned societies and also national organizations have a real role to play. So one of the partners in um, our Open Science Lab project um, is a British Science Association. Um, in fact, on Friday, I'm going to a British Science Association conference um, and they have sponsored one of the investigations on our Inquire platform about how can you encourage bees to your garden. Um, and uh, they are associating that with their Crest Award, which is uh, an award for scientific investigation, scientific inquiry. So I think there's a real role for um, scientific organizations, um, uh, 
as not just as sponsors, but as contributors and partners. Um, one of the things the British Science Association said was that they weren't very good at designing um, open platforms. Uh, and so they were quite happy for the OU to provide an open platform and for them to provide content and investigations and communities around that open platform. So I think there are some real opportunities for partnerships between uh, associations, learned societies, and platform providers and content providers. Uh, it's one of the things that's happening with Future Learn as well, with the British Library, British Museum, um, British Council. So I think that, um, and also the links in with commercial organizations, again, uh, not just as content partners, but as partners in open practice, I think is one of the exciting things that's happening at the moment. Okay, so um, let's move on to Terry McAndrew gets down to the dark side of academia. So Terry's question is, does academia include corrupted practices, which OERs and open practice challenge? If so, what are they? That's a great question. <laughs> we might open this up. To, uh, does anyone on the panel want to say anything before we open it up? Corrupted practices. I haven't personally seen the dark corruption. <laughs> Okay, so what about you out there? Tell us your experiences from the dark side of academia. <laughs> She's pointing her finger at somebody. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Andy Lane from the Open University. I don't know whether it's about the dark side of academia, but uh, I wonder whether there might be a paradox with uh, openness in that it is as we might all agree, we all think it's an unalloyed good. Uh, but the consequences could be globally that we see actually a widening of the educational divide because the openness serves those of us who are already well developed intellectually able to take account of it and to uh, have the educational background to make much of that openness, whereas there's a significant part of the population of this globe who can't uh, without an awful lot of support, and just making stuff open doesn't necessarily make it easy for them to access it. Mm, that's a very good point, yeah. Anyone want to follow that up, or shall we move on to some of the other? Yes, over here. Uh, which one? Alison? There is someone over here. No, sorry. I was yeah. going to give it to Alison. Can I just very quickly add to that and actually say that not only um, does the open world not is not accessible to some people, it's actually frightening and scary. And uh, you know, we've given one example of actually people being having negative experiences, and and some of the learners I work with are absolutely petrified of it. Alistair was... I, I think that's absolutely right. Um, I sometimes worry that openness is a bit like democracy, where, um, yeah, yes, uh, if you come from um, a Western liberal tradition, then democracy and openness are you know, a natural good. But to some people, they are fragging, um, and that they're not something that you can... You, know, you need to be enculturated into practices <coughs> of democracy and openness. And we mustn't just assume that everybody is incorporated into those practices. I'm just certainly, you know, from, from the, the commercial organisation point of view, I mean, uh, you know, we're sort of giving a bit of a stick about not being open enough in our practices and having some closed systems. So, um, you know, trying to do what we're doing with the, with the initiatives that we have are hopefully uh, illustrating the fact that you can open yourself up to, to, to these various initiatives and debates that are going on, but you know, there's certainly a lot, uh, a, a lot of stakeholders in the industry who are still quite terrified and, and, and worried about the, the, the consequences of that. And in fact, the original uh, question, corruption's a pretty dark word, um, and, and yes, it probably happens, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of bad teaching that goes on, right? <laughs> And uh, David Wiley has this great concept he talks about. It's the meaningless assignment. It's the assignment that the instructor gives that he really doesn't really care about. The students don't care about. And they go through the road exercise, they turn it in, and then it gets blasted away in some drawer and, and forgotten about. And so, you know, he's got the sort of system of having the students 
produce things that matter, a lot of it is in the open, producing you know, things like a textbook or the projects that go in and edit Wikipedia for content that can be better. Um, because those things matter, they're significant, and it just changes the whole process. So I, I think there's a lot of things out there where people are you know, just kind of going through the motions. And you can't do that when you're open, and that's what scares people. On the other hand, it's liberating. Okay, so my philosophy as an online teacher is I mess up a lot, and my students tell me that, and then that makes me better. And so I don't try to be perfect, and so we have this kind of culture in the class I teach where it's okay to screw up as long as you try to recover, and that's what openness is about to me. Yeah, um, just, um... So the, um, I'm kind of hearing that uh, it strikes me as a bit of an odd question. Odd question. If, if, if our job isn't to remove the barriers to entry to education, I think so, sorry, that mic is quieter than this one. So um, it seems a bit, a bit of an odd, odd question in as much as um, if our jobs as teachers and instructors isn't to um, lower the barriers to entry for to, for learning, then I'm not sure what our jobs are. I mean, this was that was my point to the to the educational academy that was running itself like a competition. You know, it's it's not the winners that actually um, that need the education. It's it's the losers that need access to the education. Mm -hmm. I certainly see that as being my job, really. Um, and so every time we write an open class or anything about the open class, as soon as we change change anything. First thing we say is: Is this going to be a barrier to entry? Is the language? Is it? Is it an academic barrier to entry? Uh, is, which language is? How have we translated it? How have we done this? Is it technologically a barrier to entry? Um, culturally, is it a barrier to entry? <coughs> and, and maybe it's not lowering the barriers; it's helping people raise themselves a little bit higher than barriers. Because I, I think some. I mean, learning should be hard. I mean, not impossible. It should be something that people rise to. Okay, so um, we're coming towards the end, so there's, there, there are a number of comments about this idea of building community. So Robert Farrell, for example, um, says, I'm suspicious of all talk about building communities, actually, so am I. <laughs> um, I'm more amenable to the idea of linking existing communities, so we can ask the panel to, to comment on that, the idea of can we actually build a community? Is it possible? Well, can we build a community? And so, one of the things that um, there's a guy called Andrew Slack. You've not heard of him, but I've gone and have a look at Andrew Slack. And he's doing this thing called the one of the things he's started, he's founded, is the Harry Potter Alliance. And one of the things he talks about is um, cultural acupuncture. And he says that he will sort of he will, um, he will sort of use this um, these men's this he will use these, um, these surges in the in I don't know, how would you describe it? Search and interest, the growth of, of communities, and he draws them into his class. And it's something that I've always done, sorry, um, I've always done um, in as much as I always brought people, in, um, brought people into the class that had a, 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 had a following with them. They were engaged, and they, they engaged with their followers, and they brought that following to the class. And the class got bigger every time they did that. And so I, I, it kind of happened by accident, but um, I think it's. Yes, Basically, we just go where the fish are already swimming. We do what Andrew Slack says, and we tap into this cultural acupuncture. So yes, you can tap into communities of interest if you don't ask them to change their existing modes of, uh, patterns of behaviour. You just tailor your, your message to suit them. And then you, you can quite efficiently build a, a community quite quickly. I see it, it's happened already, you know, with the, kind of the, the first wave of a lot of the, the scenes that happened, there's like these Try it. Well, it's, you see them on Twitter, so but we've seen people come into DS106 from the I'm already forgetting all the other names of the CDC MOOC, and so they, they kind of circulate. And there's the Rise on 14 group, and they then they bring other people along with them. But it's not like we have to say, okay, you guys need to talk to you guys. Um, but having the places that they can go and the affordances um, that aren't behind a, a login or something that is. is I mean, to me, those are those uh, walls on the master plan communities. And a lot of these things um, are put behind these uh, logging walls. Yeah, I, I mean, I would just say I, I do think it's possible to build communities. I, I get that, that linking communities is uh, 
is uh, more established, and, and they're all various communities out there who, who are talking and debating. So, so linking those communities is, is, is very important. But I think you can still build communities, they'll be from existing uh, voices. But I think the whole point of it around open a lot of the time is that you can start reaching new audiences uh, and new people uh, and reach out to these debates uh, and start your own uh, uh, research platforms and, and, and ask your own questions and get feedback and that, that's the beauty of open and what's happening new digitally and new developments going on at the moment. So I think these false dichotomies, of course you and of course you can link communities. Um, and one of the aspects of building communities is that um, they can be built from the bottom up. Um, fanzines, for example. And also, I mean, people who are getting access to the web for the first time, um, they don't necessarily want to join an existing community. They want to form their own localized or culturally relevant communities. And we need to be providing resources um, in general terms, um, to allow them to do that. So I don't mean providing top-down um, uh, community templates, but to enable them to grow those communities from the bottom up. So there are going to be some communities that forge from other communities. There are going to be some communities that coagulate or crystallize around locations or around shared interests. And that's good. And What's again most interesting and exciting is that there are new tools to allow that to be done, to be able to create not just resources easily, but to create communities easily. This man, you have a question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> First of all, it's not a false Rob? Like, it? <laughs> Introduce yourself, please. Uh, Rob Farrow. Oh, is it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Faxter. Okay, uh, Rob Farrow, Deming University UK. Um, so my comment wasn't really about trying to dichotomize this in the first place. Um, I'm just really saying we should be a little bit suspicious about any, any talk which says we're going to build a community. And in the end, you started off Mike by saying, yes, of course we can build communities. But the end, you're really saying we should be helping other people to build their own communities. That's the important difference that I was trying to address. Exactly, we agree. I'm very glad. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so as the gatekeeper of this community, I'm afraid that we have to draw our, our discussions to a close um, because we're running out of time. But I would urge you to, because there are lots more questions and really interesting ideas to come. So ask your questions directly, and um, that's really social media. And um, so I thank you, thank everybody on the panel for, for really interesting and stimulating input. Um, and, and thank you all for the amazing questions. Sorry we didn't get around to your question. And now I'm going to hand over to Megan. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, and, and particularly thank you to the panel for what I think has been an absolutely fascinating session.